All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Zoom with MDRU 6. Um, I'd like to officially welcome you all for participating. We had over uh, 120 participants um, registered, so I suspect that um, people will start rolling in. Um, so I won't be closing this room just so that people can join in as they come in. Um, I want to officially uh, introduce myself for those who haven't, uh, who I haven't had a chance to meet. I'm Jean Liu. I work for MDRU. I'm the Events and Stakeholder Relations Manager. Um, today, we've had the opportunity to um, collaborate with Team CoreScan. Um, we've been talking about this uh, a Zoom session since the summer, and we thought this would be a great topic for us to kind of revisit um, uh, in September. Um, a little intro. Um, this is alumni and friends. Erin um, Luby has been an alumni and she completed in 2015. Um, her advisors were uh, Craig Hart and Thomas Bissick, and she was working on the Blackwater Project. Um, Carrie Diel did her PhD at UBC and completed in 2001. Her advisors were Lee Grout and John Thompson. And last but not least, we've got Cass Herndon. Uh, she's a longtime friend with MDRU's research team. So I want to officially welcome all three of them. Um, I look forward to having you all, uh, you know, sort of running through your knowledge and um, I will pass it over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Jean. Um, we're going to get rolling here. Um, Aaron's going to put up a few slides. And yeah, we just want to say really thanks to thanks to MVRU for the um, for the chance to participate uh, in this uh, Zoom session today. Um, it's always great to to chat to the MVRU crowd, um, MVRU and friends, anyways. And uh, Jean, thanks for keeping us very organized. So the the talks that we're going to give today is we're really um, going to be focused on the use of hyperspectral imaging in mining and mineral exploration. Now, a large uh, part of the session is going to be devoted to a very general overview of spectroscopy, looking at sort of really outlining the fundamentals of this method. And Aaron Luby is going to be talking about this for us. And we're just note we are going to be focusing in particular on veneer and SWIR spectroscopy. Um, and Aaron's going to sort of explain exactly what, what we mean by that. Now, once uh, you're all experts and familiar with the basics, we're going to show you an example of how hyperspectral imaging technologies can, um, can be applied in a very specific ore environment. And we're gonna take a, uh, a look at detail at some alkalic porphyry deposits, which are a BC specialty. We're gonna end um, with Cass and she's gonna give us a, a short discussion on some recent advances in hyperspectral imaging technologies, where we are really looking to combine uh, hyperspectral information with other types of data for novel applications in both mining and mineral processing. Um, now, as Jean said, uh, Aaron Cass and I are uh, part of Team CoreScan. We're a, CoreScan is a global service provider for hyperspectral core imaging, which is based uh, in Australia. Uh, none of us are actually in Australia. Cass and Aaron are both based out of the Vancouver office. So for, the, for those of you in Vancouver, they are always available uh, for any um, office chats. And I worked out of uh, Montreal at the moment. So while you are going to see a lot of images um, that do come from CoreScan, the, the technology that we're going to talk about today is, is really not specific to any particular company. The intention of this is to provide a very general overview on, on the application of hyperspectral imaging technologies to the mining industry. Um, so we're going to run through this. Hopefully there'll be plenty of time for some questions and some discussion at the end. And Jean will just uh, rely on you to keep us on track and uh, keep a record of any questions that come in. So I'm going to hand over to Aaron, who's going to get us started. Thanks, Carrie. Okay. So, oops, excuse me. Uh, it seems com common knowledge that as geologists, that during prospecting and exploration, as we vector towards uh, mineralization through alteration footprints, that mineral identification uh, is key, just understanding where we are located within a mineral system. Uh, but I actually wanted to address the importance of mineralogy 
its characterization and mineral abundance, not just in the beginning of the mining life cycle, but instead throughout its entirety. So for example, uh, we can reduce cost and improve efficiency in mineral extraction through identifying problematic minerals. So um, at CoreScan, we're often asked to focus on mapping minerals such as smectites or talc, and that's because they can potentially complicate our mineral processing. Mineralogy helps uh, geotechnical engineers predict rock strength for mine design. So whether, you not, whether or not you have hard mineralogy such as quartz or soft mineralogy such as silicates, has major implications for slope design. And knowledge of our mineralogy can even help us to mitigate acid rock drainage uh, through the identification of acid generating versus buffering mineralogy. So really, the list goes on. Um, there are a plethora of ways that having robust mineralogical data can serve us within our industry. And mineralogy has always been important to us. But as we try to improve efficiencies within our mining value chain, uh, it would be fruitful to bring accurate mineral ID much earlier into our timelines. So the question is, how do we, how do we go about doing this? How do we spare ourselves grief? And firstly, we need to look at how we're measuring mineralogy. Many mineralogical identification methods are performed on a small scale, potentially at inconsistent spatial intervals throughout one or many drill holes. And then we have to assume that a few hundred point measurements, whether it's clam scan, XRD, vitrography, a combination of methods, um, we have to assume that it characterizes an entire deposit, which as we know, might not be the case. Um, so uh, what we need is uh, a method that can tie together the various scales that, that we work at. Um, hyperspectral core imagery is an option to fill this niche, um, particularly at the core scale. Um, and at the same time, it collects consistent continuous mineralogical data. So to help everyone gain a better understanding of hyperspectral core imagery, I'm going to review some of the basics of spectroscopy and hyperspectral imagery. I'm going to discuss what reflectance spectroscopy technology is available to us. And lastly, I'll go over what sort of products you can expect to see um, if you've decided to collect hyperspectral core imagery data. So spectroscopy, it gets defined as the study of the interaction of light or electromagnetic radiation with matter. Light gets defined as an oscillating electric and magnetic field. These fields are perpendicular to each other and they travel at a, the speed of light within a vacuum. So our electromagnetic spectrum uh, is divided into regions based off of light's wavelength. So uh, ranging, it ranges from very short uh, wavelength gamma rays, for example, uh, which are just a fraction of a nanometer long, to meter long radio waves. Um, and these shorter wavelengths are higher energy light, and these longer wavelengths are lower energy light. Uh, so for reference, here's our visible light range, uh, extending from 0.35 to 0.7 microns. And I also wanted to point out the infrared range uh, which extends from 0.7 to 1,000 microns. Uh, this region is called the infrared um, because infra means below or sub, and it is just below um, our red uh, visible light um, in terms of energy. So I'd like to go a bit more into detail about the infrared in the next slide. Um, it's important to us for spectral geology, and there's a lot of nomenclature uh, pertaining to this region. So uh, the infrared is broken up into various subregions, uh, but there seems to be no consensus at all on where any of these regions start or end. And that's largely due to the different applications for of spectroscopy and also the different detectors that are used. Generally speaking, um, in spectral geology, 
uh, we have the near, short, mid, uh, long wave or thermal, and far infrared regions with rough boundaries at 1.35, 2.5, 8, 15, and 1,000 microns, respectively. Um, and underneath, I just threw in an example of how an astronomer might instead uh, break up the infrared. Um, and obviously, these are, these are very different uh, subdivisions relative to spectral geology. So over here on the far right, I've listed some widely used abbreviations um, for these electromagnetic regions. And I just wanted to point out a few of them because I'll be using them today. Uh, we have the VIS, short for visible, the near, uh, short for near infrared, the veneer, which is a combination of visible and near infrared, and SWIR, uh, which refers to short wave infrared. Uh, there is a specific wavelength range of light, the veneer and SWIR, um, which ranges from about 450 to 2500 nanometers that as I will explain in a bit, is very effective for the identification of hydrothermal alteration minerals using reflectance spectroscopy. So when light interaction, when light radiation interacts um, with the surface, it can absorb or possibly be, be transmitted. It can reflect and or partly scatter. Uh, absorption occurs when the incoming light is deposited when, within a medium. Um, it's important to geologists and reflectance spectroscopy as many mineral diagnostic absorption bands occur within the veneer and swear. Our light absorption mechanisms are different for these two ranges. Um, the veneer light has enough energy to change an electron energy state while lower energy SWIR radiation uh, can cause molecules to vibrate, uh, meaning the bonds between your atoms are bending and stretching in very predictable geometries. With both of these types of processes, a photon's energy uh, must equal the difference between the lower and higher uh, energy state. Um, these changes are quantized and vary for each element or molecular bond. So the energy which is absorbed in the interaction is a fingerprint for that chemical species. And that is the basis for why spectroscopy is so successful. So finally, uh, I'm, I get to show you some example of mineral spectra. Uh, we have on the x-axis in uh, wavelengths uh, here it's in nanometers. And on the y-axis, we usually have reflectance, uh, usually in percent. Um, here I've stacked the reflectance values just so it's easier for us to view our spectra. So all of these spectra that I'm showing you have examples of diagnostic absorption bands in the veneer. And historically, uh, the veneer has been used exhaustively uh, to map your iron oxide speciation. So for example, whether or not you have hematite, specularite, guthite, magnetite, uh, but iron oxides aren't actually the only minerals that are active in this region. Um, the veneer contains diagnostic absorption bands of minerals that are typically thought to be inactive actually in the veneering source. So, um, it's a really important region of light that contains a lot of information to geologists, and I'd like to walk you through some of these spectra. Over here in pink on the top left, we have a carbonate spectrum. And you can see a manganese is being incorporated into your carbonate because you have the development of a feature at 560 nanometers. Another feature that we see really frequently, almost in every project, is the development of a very large uh, absorption doublet slash maybe trough at this point um, between 1050 and 1450 nanometers. Uh, and that's due to iron being incorporated into our carbonate. Uh, we can map some sulfides, uh, molybdenite and 
scholar are examples of uh, sulfides that have absorption features in the veneer. Uh, I would say maybe in the past five to 10 years, a lot of research has been dedicated to establishing uh, rare earth element reference spectra um, and also minerals rare, with rare earth elements. Um, and the rare earths tend to show a really busy absorption clusters uh, within these shorter wavelength regions. Over here on the upper right are some example of garnet reference spectra. Um, as we uh, start including chromium, manganese, and iron into our garnets, we have diagnostic absorption bands in the veneer. We can differentiate between ortho and clinoperoxines um, using iron features uh, located at about 1,000 nanometers. Uh, and the same goes for albine. It also has an iron feature at around 1030 nanometers. So moving on to the SOAR region, uh, the SOAR is renowned for mapping hydrothermal alteration uh, as it contains diagnostic absorption features related to hydroxyl uh, and carbonate bonds. It's been applied to a huge range of deposit styles and project types. Uh, this isn't a full list, but it just so shows some examples um, ranging from, you know, Carlin style, greenstone gold, uh, Stedex, VMS, uh, nickel laterites. Um, there's been a huge range of projects where hyperspectral has been applied. So really, um, also, I just wanted to point out that the SOAR has been applied uh, for decades to mapping porphyry and epithermal systems, um, as it's capable of, cap capable of mapping the majority of minerals uh, that you would see here in our, in our classic um, magmatic hydrothermal temperature pH diagram by Corbin and Leach. So. And here's just a nice summary of the general band locations um, for, for most of our absorption features in the veneer and spar. And you can see over here, we have our transition metals in the veneer as well as borate. And then over on the right in the spar, we have a lot of our hydroxyl bonds uh, and, and carbonate features. So moving on to what instrumentation uh, is available to us. There are reflectance spectroscopic methods fit for most purposes, uh, ranging from regional scale uh, all the way down to hand sample scale. Um, and as such, there's a lot of factors to consider when choosing an approach, uh, including uh, your spectral resolution, your spatial resolution, band coverage, um, whether or not you need imaging versus a non-imaging system. So just wanted to talk about spectral resolution briefly. Um, over here in the right column, I have listed uh, various scales of systems ranging from satellite down to portable and lab scale systems. Um, and on the left here, I'm showing you examples of bandwidths or spectral resolutions, which you might find in various systems. In general, as you move from remote systems, such as satellite and airborne, um, down to more proximal data collection, you're moving to higher resolution, uh, spec higher resolution spectroscopy. Uh, and I wanted to take a minute to clarify the term hyperspectral versus multispectral. Um, a system is referred to as multispectral when it collects targeted non-continuous bands, typically about 10 bands, um, and they might have bandwidths of about 100 nanometers. Uh, while a hyperspectral system is a term used for the collection of continuous narrow bands um, at approximately 10 nanometer bandwidths, um, and is generally, generally used more for airborne and portable and lab systems. Uh, 
And I also wanted to uh, clarify the term imaging spectroscopy. Uh, so this term means that your spectral data is collected for spatially referenced cells or pixels um, from which you can create a CNR image. Uh, the entire data set gets referred to as a data cube. And this is because your X and Y axis or your coordinates are thought of as your first and second dimension. Uh, while your spectrum uh, is thought of as your third dimension. And imaging spectroscopy tends to be used in satellite, airborne, and, and core imagery. So here's a diagram showing uh, bandwidth and band coverage for satellite remote sensing systems. Um, and that's you see that in this graph on the left. On the right, it's just names and associated um, institutions or, or companies um, as for these systems. Um, as you can see, uh, these satellite systems are multispectral uh, with band locations in the veneer, sweat, and thermal infrared. Spatial resolutions range from about 1 to 30 meters. And depending on which system you would utilize, you'd be able to check whether your actual mineralogy versus maybe whether or not you just have hydrothermal alteration in general. And here are some examples of airborne system band locations and spectral uh, resolutions. These are hyperspectral systems with bands in the, the, bands in the veneer and swear. Uh, and your cellular pixel size will vary between 2 and 12 meters. Uh, both your satellite and airborne systems have options for publicly available as well as commercially supplied data sets. So really, we have a whole ecosystem of reflectance spectroscopy technology. Uh, in addition to satellite and airborne, we have drone and outcrop face mapping systems. Um, uh, we have line profiling data, uh, where you continuously collect data down a narrow strip of your core, uh, and that is lab-based. Uh, we have portable handheld spectrometers. Uh, that acquire point data. Um, really, these handhelds have been around since the 90s, and they are still proving their worth today. Um, they have a spot size of about one to two centimeters. Um, and while they don't image your data, they're rugged, they can be rugged and easy to transport in the field. So there is that potential for live interpretation just on site or in the field. Um, or alternatively, you can. Uh, Train a, they're fairly easy to use. So you can also train a technician um, to collect the data if that's preferred. And the majority, I believe these instruments mostly collect in the veneer and swear. Um, and lastly, we have lab-based hyperspectral core imagery, uh, which can image your core, collecting 200,000 spectrum. And even though this technology is referred to as core imagery, I just wanted to quickly point out that you can also uh, scan hand samples, chips or cuttings, uh, soils, a whole range of sample types. So there are numerous advantages to hyperspectral core imagery. Um, uh, the small pixel size that helps, is able to help a spectroscopist pick apart what would normally be an ambiguous uh, mineral mixture or spectrum. Um, over here on the left is an example of a potentially ambiguous spectrum uh, due to your one, due to a one to two centimeter spot size. But over here on the right, you can see that as we increase our spatial resolution, we reduce our pixel size to half a millimeter and can break up the spectrum into its contributing components uh, which in this case would be alienite, topaz, and perovolate. Uh, having access to spatially referenced data can help us to 
uh, extract textural information, um, which in could include petrogenesis, um, your alterations texture, whether it's standard pervasive, potentially your parigenesis or even grain size. And having continuous sampling assures that you uh, have data that represents <laughs> accurately represents your mineralogy. Um, so just wanted to talk about this image. Over here on the left, we have a core photo. It looks pretty homogenous. Over here on the far right is a white mica mineral match. And in the middle is a kaolinite mineral match. And the point I'm trying to make here is that if you took a measurement up at the top of this interval, you would probably have to assume that the rest of your interval was white mica dominant, which might not be the case here. It looks like you're switching to a more kaolinite dominant alteration. And lastly, this is high volume data. So there are applications for later on for machine learning. So I'd like to just briefly run you through what deliverables you could expect um, if you find yourself collecting hyperspectral imagery data. And while these products are going to be uh, mostly specific to core scan, I, they can be applied to hyperspectral core imagery in general. And after, uh, if you are interested in familiarizing yourself a bit more with these products, you can do so um, by following this link here. So core, core scan in conjunction with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources have made core imaging data available for 34 drill holes across the state of Minnesota. Um, if you don't have time to write down this link, just do a search for core scan and MDNR it should be the first thing that pops up. So before a spectroscopist can create any imagery products, it's necessary to develop a project library. Uh, so our references, they can come from within the projects themselves, or alternatively, they could be derived from public data sets, such as those provided by the USGS or NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or just any, any extra published spectral material that's out there. So the creation of a mineral match is an interpretive process um, by which you're comparing project spectra, uh, such as what you see here in red and blue to your reference library spectrum um, in this image that's represented by this black spectrum on the top. Um, so for example, uh, in Allianite, if you wanted your project, project spectrum to match closely to the shape uh, between 1400 and 1500 nanometers, your red spectrum over here would have a very high quality match. Um, whereas your blue spectrum down at the bottom uh, shows alienite mineral mixtures. Um, and as such, it's developed extra additional absorption features within this range. So your matching algorithm would rank this spectrum as a lower match. And your mineral match image uh, is just a visual representation of this information where uh, warmer colors indicate a spectrum with a better match and obviously blue with a lower. So we can also use spectral parameters to track changes in mineral chemistry. Uh, in the middle, here's a mineral match image that does not show much variation within its match intensity. Uh, this is a carbonate mineral match. Or on the right, we have a carbonate, a carbonate composition image showing um, iron content. And when you look at the iron content within this carbonate, you're able to see cross-cutting relationships that might not originally have been viewed in the mineral match map. Uh, here is another nice example of a composition image. This is from uh, another system other than core scans HCI3. Um, it's called the spec, it's from the Speckman Sisu rock. Um, these images are from a paper recently published in 2020. I'm sorry, I can't um, pronounce this name accurately, but it is a paper regarding hyperspectral applications to the Highland Valley porphyry deposit in British Columbia. Um, these are some really nice composition images uh, showing, for example, white mica 
2200 nanometer wavelength position. Uh, and they've also have a white mica grain size proxy. But overall, these composition images, they're very valuable and they help us understand um, overprinting relationships within our deposit. And I just wanted to highlight that we really, uh, there are a lot of composition products that can be delivered. And here's just a quick list of some of your options. And uh, one of the ultimate uh, mineralogy products that is delivered is called a mineral class map. Um, and a class map compiles all of your mineral match images into a single product for a very quick visual over, overview of, so you can see quick trends in your data. So in other words, if one pixel has several min minerals mapped within it, you have to prioritize which mineral is visible in your class map, which is uh, almost analogous to making a geological map in ARC GIS, for example. Uh, and this image is just showing your uh, core photography on the left, and then your associated mineral matches um, for this interval. And over on the right is your associated mineral class map. On the top right, uh, it's showing basically your, your stacking order or your priority of minerals um, with sulfide on the top and a spectral on the bottom. And for example, if I looked at a pixel just over here, um, you can see that both Montmorillonite and Kaolinite have been mapped in that pixel. Um, Kaolinite has a higher priority, therefore it's what's showing up in your mineral class map as this brown color. Uh, so hyperspectral imagery is not just a nice picture. Uh, it is, our images are data, uh, but we obviously need a way to export this mineralogical data into third-party software so we can do our statistical and 3D analysis. Uh, to do this, the final delivery product uh, is a mineral log CSV file for importation. We count number of pixels which have been mapped of alunite, for example. Uh, within a given interval. And these intervals can range from client supplied assay data from 25 centimeters. It could be per hand sample or per soil sample, et cetera. And lastly, before I hand over the baton to Carrie, um, I just wanted to emphasize that we refer to this CSV mineral log output as pseudo quantitative. Um, and that's because based off of your spectral signature, I cannot determine how much of the mineral is present within each pixel. Instead, we can only map whether or not um, this mineral is present uh, in the pixel. So in short, your spectral signature is not necessarily an average of your spectral signatures of your separate minerals, mineral species within that pixel. There's many factors that contribute to your final signal or response that are outside of abundance. And these include, but are not limited to grain size, mineral chemistry, potentially how intimate of a mineral mixture you have, or whether even if one mineral is coating another mineral. So in short, um, this isn't just math, this light is complicated. So the remainder of our time will be spent going over examples of applications from various phases within our mining life cycle. Carrie Deal will focus on uh, exploration within BC's porphyry deposits, and she'll be followed by Cassidy Harridan, who will follow up with applications of hyperspectral to geotechnical and geometallurgical studies. Thanks, Aaron. Um, all right, thank you so much, Aaron. We just, I was, uh, we've been uh, really interested in the, the poll results um, that, that have come through. It looks like we have quite a range of, uh, of people with various levels of experience uh, in hyperspectral uh, analysis from uh, complete beginners to uh, through to some experts. So we're trying to tailor this talk to, to sort of hit the middle ground, but um, feel free to, um, jump in or uh, text any questions uh, to the chat line and we certainly will address those uh, later on in the session.
So I'm going to get this set up and share my screen. Somehow share my screen. Erin, are we still sharing? Here we go. It will work, I promise. I just have to get the right one up. There we go. Can you guys see that? Got the, uh, until I've got the orange core scan glow going on here from my computer screen. Um, so we're now going to move on and we're going to look at, start looking at um, how we could apply uh, hyperspectral imaging technologies in, in a very specific uh, uh, type of ore deposit. And we're going to look um, in some detail at BC uh, alkalic porphyry systems. Now, if anyone is familiar with veneer and sphere spectroscopy, and it looks from our poll that we certainly have uh, several people who are, who are quite familiar with the system. Um, I'm sure you already know that really, and Aaron mentioned this, porphyry and epithermal systems are really ideally suited to hyperspectral analysis. Uh, the alteration mineralogy within these systems uh, is really, um, uh, is, is really uh, has a lot of minerals or hydrous mineral groups, um, and therefore these features really light up in the veneer and the swear range. There also tends to be a fairly consistent zonation or gradation away from a mineralized center towards lower temperature hydrous mineral phases. So we can use various spectral features like Aaron mentioned to track fluid pathways. Um, now the types of, of input that something like hyperspectral core imaging can provide is, is summed up pretty nicely in this diagram that, that Anthony Harris put together several years ago. It really shows the, the, the potential to generate important information uh, in terms of mineral parogenesis, mineral proxies, um, knowledge of the broader alteration footprint of these systems, as well as quantifiable mineralogy. Now we do want to stress that um, Spectroscopy is it's just one tool that can be used in the exploration or the characterization of these systems. Um, it is a great tool, but it is all the more powerful when you, it is used in combination with a solid geological input and many other types of data and observations. Now, if we're going to focusing in on BC alkalic deposits, Alkalic systems are, include some of the world's um, richest uh, or highest grade uh, porphyry gold resources, and they occur in just a few mineral provinces worldwide, uh, one being Eastern Australia uh, in and around the Cadia district in New South Wales, and the other being British Columbia. Now, this class of deposit has uh, features that distinguish them from calcalcalic and subalkalic systems. Um, alkalic deposits, they're locally um, quite high grade, and they tend to be associated with smaller volume uh, pipe-like intrusions, and they tend to have low sulfide contents overall. So they can represent uh, fairly difficult um, uh, exploration targets. Now, BC alkalic porphyries are quite variable, both in terms of their metal contents as well as deposit characteristics. And uh, for a large part, they are hosted in quite a range of different volcanic settings, uh, as you can see in this diagram over to the right, which range from basaltic facies to monzoninic intrusions of varying geometries. Now, there's a lot of knowledge about BC alkalic systems, and this comes from a range of sources. Uh, there are a lot of exploration companies, uh, mining and uh, or mining companies working in this region. And there's also been several large scale research programs uh, with MBRU, uh, including Geoscience BC, uh, collaborations with CODES in Australia. And more recently, it was uh, some of these systems were the focus of um, a recent CMIC uh, footprints project. So there's quite a lot of information that we're sort of pulling on for these um, for the knowledge of these systems. Now, uh, BC alkalic uh, porphyries they occur in the 
Cornell and Stikine terrains, um, and they do show quite a bit of variability in their characteristics. And this is um, due in large part to their associations with either silica saturated or silica undersaturated intrusions. Um, this produces quite variable copper to gold ratios and also quite variable alteration patterns. But what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to focus on some of the mineralogy that is in common to many of these types of systems. Now, hyperspectral analysis, um, whether it's point systems or imaging systems, um, it's very effective at uh, mineral identification and mapping for many of the key components in alkalic deposits. Um, we have, I have used, personally used a lot of point systems um, for, for many years. And really in terms of the mineral identification, you can get a lot of great data and adding the Im imaging capacity uh, gives extra, a lot of extra values of information too. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to show several examples of some of the key minerals and spectral parameters that can be used as guides or vectors within these systems. Um, and then um, after this, we will sort of, oh, I'm going to let Cass talk about some of the, um, some really what the core Im imaging applications and the technology adds to geotechnical and uh, geomedical ap applications as well. Now the alteration model for alkalic porphyries can be fairly difficult to define since there is so much variability. Um, tend to fall back on one of the sort of the original model diagrams that I've shown here uh, that was generated by Alan Wilson um, based on work in uh, the Cadia District of Australia. But a lot of these characteristics uh, can be applied to BC systems as well. Uh, saying that, um, on this uh, first slide here, what, one of the features that does tend to be lacking in a lot of the BC systems is the development of any type of a lithocap, um, as well as really sort of clearly defined or abundant argillic type assemblages. Not always, but in most cases. Now, if they were present, um, they, we, a lot of the mineralogy that we would expect to see, um, white micas, carbonates, and tourmaline, for example, these are all very easily mappable with veneer and sewer technology, um, as we can see in this one example here with the core photography and a uh, mineral class map. Now, underneath the sort of alkalic lithocap, if there is one, um, the green rock environment is one environment that has certainly got a lot of attention from explorationists and researchers over the past few years. And it's particularly relevant to exploration in and around alkalic porphyry systems, since the, uh, the intrusions or the mineralized center can be really very narrow or quite restricted in scale. So the occurrence of minerals such as chlorite, epidote, carbonate, these are all things that can really easily be tracked using veneer spectroscopy. And not only can we identify the mineralogy, but um, as Aaron mentioned, geochemical features such as the iron magnesium ratios in chlorite or the iron content in carbonates, these can also be measured and uh, they can also prove to be valuable exploration tools and characterization tools for different uh, stages of alteration. Now going sort of inwards towards uh, the intrusive center or what could be the intrusive center of your system, um, the, the nature of alteration tends to change and you get uh, the occurrence of amphiboles um, and sort of higher temperature assemblages uh, and most and it, it, typically it occurs in association with a lot of epidote and potentially hematite. Now, one mineral that um, hasn't gotten much attention to date um, and it isn't even shown on this diagram here is prenite. And the prenite, if you can look at the, uh, the core photography and the mineral class map that's shown in this diagram here to the right, you can see that prenite occurs as this sort of white, white colored uh, overprint mineral um, in, in, the, uh, in the chlorite amphibolus stuff. Now, um, I'm gonna talk about prenite again in some detail. It is one of my favorites, so uh, I'll come back to that. Now, as you move closer to the core of alkalic porphyry systems, um, you typically tend to get um, calc, potassic uh, rich assemblages, uh, biotites, amphiboles, chlorites, all of these are identifiable in the SWIR region. Now mixtures of these phases can be uh, tricky to decipher in some cases, and this is where considerations like spectral resolution and spot size are, are really critical if you're thinking about using this technology. Um, magnetite, magnetite shown here um, in the diagram, and it really has some lovely, these broad iron features in the veneer region. 
Um, again, it can be tricky to identify in mixtures, but this is something that, that, that we can do regularly. Um, and we do do this regularly, particularly in iron ore systems. Um, I know iron ore geologists are, are definitely a, a special breed, um, but we do have one spectral geologist on our team who loves nothing, nothing more than he just spends his time picking out, um, you know, picking apart various species of goethite and hematite and magnetite mixtures. So we're really uh, happy to take, uh, take this information and apply it to other systems um, like, like the alkalic porphyries as well. Now, I did promise that we would concentrate on a sort of a few key minerals or uh, characteristics of alkalic porphyry systems. And we're going to look at a few uh, mineral vectors. And we're going to start with epidote. Um, epidote, uh, as we all know, it's a very common mineral in, in porphyry systems. And it's especially prominent in a lot of, in a lot of the alkalic uh, flavored ones. Now, at a, at a district scale, uh, epidote is one of the most uh, sort of widespread porphyry-related minerals, and, and it can be identified um, in, in outcrop and in, in hand specimens up to several kilometers away from deposit centers. Um, this is shown effectively by, uh, by recent mapping that was done in and around uh, the North Parks region, which is a silica-saturated alkalic porphyry near Cadia. And this mapping was done here, shown here um, on the bottom right image. There's also been quite a bit of work showing the use of epidote uh, as a porphyry indicator mineral uh, based on distribution in till samples. And this is obviously very relevant to the Canadian explorers. Now this is it's illustrated really nicely in this top diagram here. This is recent work by uh, Plouffe and others that showed, epidote, uh, showed that epidote accumulates in till concentrates near and down ice from mineralized zones. The example that we're showing here is from the Mount Pauli mine region. And note that the scale here is on sort of tens of kilometers. And now this particular example, it's not based on any spectral work, but spectroscopy could easily be applied to till samples. It's something that we can easily measure. And you would get the added utility of um, epidote geochemical variations as well. Now, considerable work has been focused on epidote occurrences um, and geochemistry in the, in the green rock environment. Um, and I'm gonna just switch back to this one. Um, on, a, on a micro scale, the trace element geochemistry of, of epidote in propolitic system halo and propolitic alteration halos has been studied by um, Dave Cook and others over the past sort of 10 to five to 10 years using laser ablation techniques to identify halos up to several kilometers in, uh, from deposit centers. Now, the spectral analysis of epidote offers geochemical information at a scale that is in between those, these two extremes that we've been talking about, the, the micro scale, the, uh, the laser ablation analysis, and the district scale, the till mapping or the outcrop mapping. The SWIR signature of epidote is quite distinct, and it's got um, an OH-related absorption feature that occurs at about 1550, uh, 1550 nanometers. And it is known that this feature, it shifts to shorter wavelengths with higher iron contents. And in fact, we can actually trace the amount of iron substitution from N-member epidote to aluminum-rich clinozoazite if we have adequate spatial resolution, spectral resolution. Um, now, this is of particular interest in alkalic systems since the proportion of clinozoazite to epidote in the so solid solution series is dependent in large part on the redox state of the fluids, with clinozoazite being favored um, under more reduced and, and also acidic conditions. Now, we know based on a lot of um, ice, uh, sulfur isotope work that there really is a strong redox control in many alkalic systems. So um, this gradient could potentially be uh, tracked using uh, epidote spectroscopy as well. Now, I did promise that I'd get back to talking about uh, one of my current favorite minerals, uh, which is prenite. Um, so prenite is a, is a, is a calc silicate that um, when actually you start looking for it, it's actually a very common component of alteration in and around uh, alkalic porphyry systems. Now, because it's difficult to recognize visually, it hasn't been documented uh, nearly to the same extent as something like epidote or chlorite. Um, but it turns out prenite actually has a very distinctive spectral signature with very clear SWIR absorption and band ratios. Um, so it can really be tracked very easily if you have the right tools. 
Um, the image on the right here, the photograph is uh, a piece of core from Highland Valley, which shows really just how difficult it could be to consistently map prenite in either drill core or outcrop. This is the core photo on the top, and then over, I've overlain uh, a map of, of, of the prenite uh, mapped through, um, through spectroscopy on the bottom. Now, the distribution of prenite in and around um, Highland Valley in particular has been really nicely outlined uh, as part of the recent CMIC Footprints project. I've included one of, one of the maps, one of the outcomes from this project there from Kevin Burns' work. Um, and I'm just, I'm glad it's getting some sort of well-deserved attention. Now, what they have found at Highland Valley is that uh, prenite, uh, typically in association with white mica, is the most common and widely widely distributed um, alteration in the batholith. These, um, these phases are most abundant uh, in the core of the porphyry system, but that prenite veins can be recognized um, up to eight kilometers away from deposits within this district. Now, what is particularly interesting about prenite is like epidote, there's a potential to use spectral features to track geochemical variations as well, since prenite can incorporate iron and likely um, manganese as well in the crystal lattice. So this should be reflected in the spectral signature as well. Now, the last item that I'm going to highlight today uh, is really one of the most common characteristics uh, of alkalic porphyries. And this is the red coloration that we see in almost all deposits of this type uh, to, to some extent, although it is variable. Now the coloration is usually due to microhematite inclusions or hematite, uh, um, or hematite that occurs in feldspars, whether it's potassium feldspar or plagioclase. Um, you can see examples that I've shown here. The, um, on the left, there's a very sort of patchy coloration in some rocks from Highland Valley. Uh, to a much more very selective coloration um, in some of the feldspars from Galore Creek to these uh, reddened vein halos that we saw that we can see uh, from the red crisp deposit. Now, when we scan these rocks, we actually rarely see veneer signatures that we, we would expect to see from hematite. Um, and that's probably because these inclusions are just so tiny. Um, now, we, we know that we can map hematite very effectively, so, but the, 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 the grain size considerations uh, mean that it is often just uh, invisible to, uh, to some of the instrumentation out there. Now, uh, however, if we do have an instrument or if you're using an instrument with a veneer capacity, um, what we can start to get creative and um, what we can do is that instead of trying to map mineralogical features, uh, we can try to map color variations instead. Now, this type of an approach was uh, used as part of a larger scale scanning program that we did with Newgold um, several years ago at their New Afton mine project. Now, this deposit had been explored and mined previously, and it was known that there was a very, that gold mineralization was very strongly correlated to a reddened alteration of that host rock. Now, what we were able to do is that using veneer features is we generated a proxy parameter essentially to track the distribution and the intensity of red coloration that was separate from any mappable iron oxide in this deposit. Um, Joanna Lipsky and her work with the Newgold team, what they did is they took this data and they incorporate, incorporated it into their alteration model uh, for the system. They've um, they have talked about this uh, in, in some detail previously. Shown on the left is one of their sort of their older models across one section. And on here to the right is the, the new model, which incorporated a lot of the hyperspectral core imaging data. Now, one of the key components of, uh, of the new model work uh, that I found particularly interesting was the identification of this gold zone, which shown in red in this model, with um, higher gold to copper ratios. And it was really clearly outlined with the use of this, um, what we called a red proxy measurement. We have applied this type of a parameter to several other uh, alkalic porphyry systems since then. And it um, generally proves to be a pretty useful tool to highlight both alteration intensity as well as the distribution um, of this type of alteration. So that was a bit of a uh, speed session on applications of hyperspectral core imaging to alkalic porphyry deposits. Um, 
this does happen to be one of my favorite topics, so I'm always happy to discuss in more detail. Uh, right now, though, we still have um, some really interesting material that Cass is going to show you that where we're looking at uh, mining and mineral processing applications of hyperspectral imaging. And I think this is one of Cass's favorite topics. So I will uh, let her take over from here. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the general applications of um, geotech and geomet um, for the hyperspectral imaging data. Um, both Aaron and Carrie have given a really good um, sort of summary. We've gotten, gotten the basics. We've gotten the idea of how we can use this um, for vectoring um, and that type of thing. So let's just dive into some geotechnical and geometallurgical applications. Right screen here. Okay. Um, so when we're thinking about geotechnical and geometallurgical applications, we're really thinking about how understanding how the rock is going to behave in a mining, processing, and um, recovery um, environment. And we're thinking about things like the caving and the blasting behavior and the pit wall and ground support requirements, as well as being able to monitor the rock's response to the mining process. And those three points um, sort of address what we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, geotechnical assessment. When we move into the geometallurgical assessment, we're thinking about things like the distribution and speciation of both ore and gang minerals, um, how hard those minerals are, and um, both individually um, as grains, but also as a whole rock mass, what sort of the hardness um, parameters we're dealing with. We're thinking about texture and parogenesis of both ore and gang mineralogy. And um, from the geoenvironmental space, also thinking about things like acid production and or neutralizing potential of the minerals that are um, present in our rocks. So this is just kind of an overview of the things that we're thinking about when we're moving into that space. And that trans transitions us very nicely into the opportunities that we have with hyperspectral imaging to address questions that we have in that space. So hyperspectral imaging systems um, capture multiple co-registered data sets, um, and all of these data sets can be used to sort of address different questions that relate to geotechnical and geometallurgical characterization. Um, some examples of different sensors that could be on board a um, hyperspectral imaging sensor, sensor um, system are RGB camera, so that's just taking a high resolution photograph of your um, samples, whatever it is you're analyzing. And that allows us to capture visible textures um, for geometallurgical considerations, but also the position of the orientation line. So if we're thinking about our geotechnical analysis, um, we need that RGB camera to detect the orientation line. Having the hyperspectral imaging um, available to us means that we're able to map mineralogy, which includes both the um, mineralogy in and around fractures, um, but we can also map the mineral texture using the veneer swir images that we detect. We can map mineral grain sizes as well as the parogenesis of those minerals within our rock mass. Um, the three D core profiler image. Um, so if you don't, if you don't know what that is, we didn't really talk about it much in this talk. Um, but a three D core profiler essentially allows us to put together a um, digital elevation model of the surface of our sample. And this is really useful when we're thinking about how we're going to detect um, defects in our rock. So things like fractures and joints and faults and those types of things. Um, other hyperspectral imaging systems um, have different sensors on board. They can have things like XRF, um, line scan chemistry, um, which is what you see on the bottom right hand side of the slide here. Um, that just gives you sort of a downhole profile um, using XRF technology of the chemistry of the rocks that you're analyzing. So being able to combine these different data sets, again, sort of gives us different pieces of information that we can apply to answering the geotechnical and geometallurgical questions. So look, digging into that a little bit deeper um, with the geotechnical space, um, using the hyperspectral imaging uh, mineralogy, in addition to the 3D laser profiler data, gives us the opportunity to have very high volumes of consistent drill core information that we can use for our geotechnical assessment. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can do things like detect joints or fractures or defects in the core. Um, because that data exists in three dimensions with our laser profiling data, we're actually able to orient those um, fractures and defects in space. Once we have the orientations, we can do things like um, assess the number of joint or fracture sets that are present, or if you have structures, you can see where those sit um, in terms of their orientation. We can assess things like joint and fracture roughness. So because again, we have an imaging surface, um, if we can see at all down into that fracture, or if we can just see the profile of that fracture along the drill core surface, we can begin to assess things like roughness. 
Um, knowing where the, the position of those fractures are in space um, down the drill core allows us to calculate things like fracture spacing. And then of course, because we have the mineralogical data in, in some of those systems as well, that gives us the opportunity to look at the mineralogy both in and around um, our defects. And, and if we think about the things we're trying to address in the geotechnical space, we wanna know, you know, is it gonna be stable? What sort of ground support requirements are we gonna need? How is it gonna behave? when we actually excavate in it and around it. These are all really important pieces of information that we need to answer that. Now, at the moment, a lot of this data that we use for our geotechnical models is actually collected manually. Um, and that's, that's fine. We have very talented um, geotechnical engineers and geologists that do this, but they spend a lot of time collecting data. And at the end of the day, this really limits their ability to spend time interpreting the data. Um, it's also very prone to inconsistencies. It can be very different uh, results between different core loggers. It can be very different results day to day for the same core logger. Um, and it's very time consuming. If anyone has done detailed geotechnical logging um, on, a, on a drill rig, either um, exploration or mining uh, production core, it takes a very long time to do this kind of detailed analysis. So if we start to think about how we can use pieces of information that we're collecting on our um, hyperspectral core imaging systems, we can turn down the amount of time that it takes to actually collect the data that we're interested in. We can ensure that that data is collected consistently, which is key if we're going to use um, statistical methods to actually build geotechnical models. And finally, it's going to free up our personnel so that they're not spending time just out with a protractor um, and a wraparound ruler measuring, for instance, orientations, um, but it gives them the opportunity to actually spend time thinking about what that data means. And that's what you want to pay your people to do is to think about what this data means and apply their skill sets to whatever geotechnical questions you have. When we move to the geometallurgical space, um, again, we have this consistent hyperspectral imaging data. Um, and this is telling us things about texture, grain size, the species of minerals that are present. And because we're in an imaging environment, we have increased sampling statistics. So what I mean by that is um, we're hitting the minerals, we're hitting the rock mass multiple times with this hyperspectral sensor. And that means that A, minerals that are uh, perhaps more rare phases in our ore deposit um, have a better opportunity of being captured but it also means that we get really robust counting statistics for our more common minerals. And that allows us to, again, apply statistical methods to look at the distribution, the grain size, the texture, all those things that are gonna to contribute to our understanding of the geometallurgical um, uh, characterization of that deposit. So just some images here. Um, on the left-hand side, we have um, some core photos and we're looking at the talc distribution um, as well as the amphibole distribution here on the left. And on the right, we're looking at the talc distribution. So being able to speciate um, what clays are present, um, the grain size of those and the texture um, for both hard minerals, so things like amphibole, um, as well as for softer um, phyllosilicate minerals like talc is really important. And this relates back to crushing and grinding. So if you have, for instance, this sample on the left that has both hard and softer minerals in it, you need to understand the relationship between those minerals if you're going to effectively crush and grind that material. Um, we also, re it's really important that we know the distribution of talc. And the reason is that talc in a flotation circuit can cause all kinds of problems. Um, so you need to know even, even down to the 1% level. So you need to know if there's even 1% talc in your rock mass, if you're gonna put that through a flotation circuit. So again, we can characterize these things. The other thing we can do is we can actually do um, bench tests, so bench test work that says, okay, this particular piece of rock requires this much energy to crush and you need to get it down to this crushing size to liberate the minerals you're interested in. We can then relate that behavior back to the mineralogical um, data set here, and then we can roll, so a very small samples data out into a very large um, hyperspectral data set. So that's one of the key components of applying this in the geometallurgical space. It also allows us to collect um, informed um, samples. So a lot of times a geologist is told, please bring me something that's representative. Um, I think we've all probably been told that at some point. Um, having the, again, the, the information about the mineralogy that's collected in a consistent way allows you to make um, good decisions about what is actually considered representative or at least what domain you're selecting your samples from. So in this example, we have some pretty homogeneous looking rock in general. We can see there's actually two domains. There's a white mica domain on top and then a chlorite domain um, sort of in the center and then it goes back into white mica. So if we're selecting expensive bench scale metallurgical test work samples from this drill hole, we now can make more informed decisions about what we're selecting so that when we 
figure out what behavior that rock mass is going to um, going to give us, then we can roll that again back out to the data set. And we know that we're looking at these representative um, samples from these domains. Um, lastly, on the bottom of this slide is just a geo uh, environmental example. So in this case, we're looking at the estimation of the neutralizing potential based on the minerals and the textures of the minerals that are present. So we have an example of the chloride distribution as well as the carbonate distribution. And you can use that information to then give you an estimate of what the neutralizing potential of a rock mass is going to be. And that's really important when we're looking at um, both uh, tailings uh, storage as well as um, waste rock storage. And then when we're looking at the sort of end of mine life, um, how we're actually going to handle any sort of acid generation or neutralizing uh, material that we may have on our mine site. Um, talking a little bit more about sort of processing proxies and how we can model the behaviors. Um, when we're looking at test work uh, results, again, these are very expensive tests. Um, so if we can sort of collect fewer of those and then apply the results of that to a broader data set, then that gives us a lot of power in how we do our modeling. And so when we link things like mineralogy, texture, um, and, and the relationship of the, min of the minerals back to the processing behavior, then we can actually develop proxies that allow us to, um, ca again, calculate what the um, predicted behavior is for our entire data set. So this is a really great example. Um, from a 1999 paper, this, this is real data. Um, there's three different ore types here um, in different colors. And you can see that as the clay content increases in the flotation feed, we get a dramatic decrease in the copper recovery, um, both in the rougher and scavenger. And so this is um, a really important trend and really important to know about. So if we think about this principle that, okay, there's a relationship between the content of the clay in my feed and how much copper I'm actually going to be able to recover. And then we look at the image on the right hand side of this slide. We can see that in the core photo, this is a fairly homogeneous piece of rock. Um, but if you look at what it's actually made up of, we have a section of kaolinite in the top part of the image. We have a section of porophyllite and then we end in a section of montmorillonite. So these would all probably be considered clay minerals in the processing. But the species of clay that are present actually have a really big impact on, on the processing. So Montmorillonite is a smectite, it's a swelling clay. It's going to behave very differently than say the, the kaolin minerals, um, which do also affect the processing, but in a very different way. They're, they're looking at um, increasing viscosity and um, different um, pulp and, um, and flotation behaviors. So again, it's really important um, that we have this data that's able to speciate um, the minerals that are there. But then again, this consistently collected data allows us to roll out the processing parameters that we observe on a small scale to a much larger uh, data set. And those were the slides that I wanted to share about Geotech and Geomet. Um, Carrie, Aaron, and I would really like to thank everyone for taking the time today um, to, to come listen to us. And we would love to answer any questions that you have. And um, again, we're really grateful for this opportunity and to MDRU for the chance to do this. So thank you all so much. Thanks again um, to Aaron, Carrie, and Cass for um, presenting us with lots and lots of information. Um, so I'm going to open this up um, uh, to everyone at this point to ask questions. Um, do we have any? I'm just looking at the chat. Sorry, I'm looking down here. Um, I thought that the poll results were really interesting. The last poll that we did um, yeah, in totally. terms of where do you see the, see the future of collecting geological and geotechnical data? Um, most people, 90% oh, of people are definitely in agreement that some sort of combination of technology is the best, even though this is 2020, but uh, it looks like that is definitely the way things are going. And that's really interesting. Part of the reason that we put that question up um, was because, um, you know, we work with a lot of companies that are not able to actually get to, especially remote sites um, at the moment or sites that happen to be in other countries. Um, and so there's been a really big opportunity to actually start to think about how we would capture some of these data sets digitally um, using things like hyper -scan, uh, hyperspectral scanning technologies. So it's interesting to see everyone's feedback that, um, you know, it is 2020 and things are weird in the world and we have the opportunity to collect these data sets, but we really need that human interaction with the data to make sure that the data sets that we're collecting are meaningful and are useful for what we're trying to accomplish.
Okay. I see. So, I see questions, Jean. Do you want me to just, oh no, that's a, okay. That's a private one. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. It looks like there's a, a one from Sebastian. There yes, is one there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, Sebastian asked, is the fracture detection feature um, position alpha beta angles, a software feature? Is it automated or manual? If automated, how? Um, great question, Sebastian. So um, at the moment, we are actually working to automate this process. Um, and I'll go back a few slides and talk a little bit about how this process works. This is my favorite topic, so I'm so glad that you asked, because I would love to talk about this all day. Um, so the way that this works is we actually use the 3D laser profiling data. And you can see, um, it's not super clear, but in this image, you can actually pretty clearly see where these breaks are in the 3D profiling image. Um, and so that allows us to actually detect which pixels in this 3D profiling image are associated with the fracture itself. Um, and then because this data actually exists in 3D, we can use some uh, mathematical um, regression models to actually fit a three-dimensional plane through that three-dimensional data. Um, and then once we have that plane established that is a best fit for the fracture points we've selected, we can actually mathematically calculate the orientation of that fracture in space. And then if we know the trend and plunge of the drill hole, and if we know the position of the orientation line in the image, then we can actually use um, some transformation uh, mathematical methods again to actually take the position of that uh, fracture orientation, the apparent position as it sits in the core tray, and rotate it back to a um, true calculated orientation. So at the moment, this is an automated process. Um, it is something that we are working to release uh, more broadly to our clients within the coming months. And within CoreScan, at least, um, it will be an automated process that you will then, as a client, be able to QC that data um, directly. And so the idea would be that if you're in a core shack and you're doing geotechnical logging, once it's scanned, we would process the data, we would provide you with the orientations, and then you would have the opportunity to actually QC it with the core sitting in front of you. Good question. Thank you for letting me get on my soapbox. <laughs> Great stuff. We've got another one from uh, Farhad. I can't see it. Can you read it, Jean? Totally. Uh, point data are easy, fast and cheap. Core scans are nice, but slow and expensive. The missing part is outcrop bench data, let's say at the scale of one meter by one meter. Is there potential to have data at, that, at this scale? Carrie, you want to take it? <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Um, there certainly is there. There certainly is a lot of potential. Um, there's, I, I think, there's definitely room for for all scales of measurement, and I think that's one of the one of the fascinating things about spectroscopy is that it is a, a technology. The fundamentals can be applied across a number of different scales. Um, the the use of sort of handheld spectrometers um, is is, as you say, it can be very fast. Um, you can get some fairly instantaneous results. Um, the speed of core scanning, I mean, dep depends on your definition of slow, but I really think it really sort of depends how you're going to fit that into your system. But the bench scale applications, there's, there's really um, a lot of utility um, and a lot of interest uh, from the, that we've heard among the industry to do a lot more sort of bench scale work. There are systems sort of uh, out there. That where you can use um, sort of scan uh, scan pit walls. There's people are working on those types of instrumentation. Some of the work that we're doing now uh, that I know I think this is becoming a lot more common is uh, we are looking at uh, a lot of different types of material blast hole analysis, for example. And this is something that um, we can rapidly sort of uh, scan, and and you can get some some fairly consistent results in terms of mineralogy or mineral characteristics. And doing sort of blast hole analysis in combination uh, with other analytical methods is uh, is one thing that a lot of companies are sort of uh, looking at. Uh, at the moment. And you're right, Farad, that, that intermediate scale is, is really interesting. Um, and they, we do have things like outcrop mappers um, that sort of take a larger, um, some of them are imaging systems, but there are uh, other systems out there that do allow you to, to collect that information on different scales. Um, I think that uh, a lot of this technology is sort of driven by the needs of individual clients. So that includes, you know, the point systems and, and what people are actually trying to accomplish. You obviously can't drag 
you know, a, a specim or a, or, hi, or a high logger, you know, out in the field with you. Um, and so that scalability is really important, but, but ultimately um, it comes down to the needs of the industry and what they're currently after. And then also making sure um, that you're, you're sort of applying whatever technology it is that you've chosen um, in a way that makes sense for the research question you're asking. So hopefully um, people will, uh, you know, the, the more demand that there is in the industry, I guess, um, the more uh, that you'll see this technology change. So I think there's, you're right, there, there is sort of, it's not really a miss, it's, it is a missing scale in that I can't think of a really a commercially available system that collects, say, a one meter spectrum. Um, I think that they're imaging systems, but, um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I also saw that um, Craig had a question about scalability. Um, so Craig asked, um, are there any comments on scalability of this data or density of this data collection that relates to its contributions to decision-making at rock, core box, or exploration scale? Um, really great question. So there's been, um, scalability is a really interesting one because geology uh, is, you know, we deal with so many different scales anyway. And then when you start looking at the micro and macro analysis um, side of what we do, that scalability becomes really important. So Carrie, you might have some comments, but I was just gonna mention that the, um, the group down at, at University of Tasmania with CODES has been doing a lot of work looking at you know, what happens if I analyze epidote um, with a 10 micron spot um, on a laser mount, and then I scan that laser mount using, you know, whatever system you want, you know, what's the scalability? How do these things relate? Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, um, sort of the story has to do with how homogenous or how, um, how much variability there is in the samples that you're analyzing. If you have extremely variable samples, then it's very unlikely that, you know, whatever you hit with a 10 micron spot will you know, be represented in the larger, um, the larger data set. But what do you think, Carrie? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about scalability and, and, the, and the scales of these ob, uh, observations. There's there's a lot of uh, really interesting, uh, really critical mineralogical work that is that is uh, collected on on a really micro scale, and these are uh, really important considerations in terms of geomet uh, and characterizing um, all sorts of materials. And it's it is this sort of the ability to scale this up. Um, a lot of the of the research programs that we have or our sort of our research collaborations, um, a lot of this is focused on trying to look at just just that issue is if there is our sort of trace element variations uh, that people have seen in laser laser ablation analyses. How does that translate? How do we translate that into spectral features? Is it something that we can see? Is that something that you could scale up into some sort of a, uh, a, a more uh, user friendly uh, program, for example? The, the 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 data density is is such that you know we are looking at you know the big big data and all of the all of the information that we collect uh, you know images or data there's a lot of information in there and a lot of the the imagery uh, as well as the point data can, can be translated um, into into a uh, into a set of information that that is really amenable to sort of a big data approach where you're looking at uh, a combination of um, all sorts of techniques, uh, building and machine learning exercises, looking at uh, looking at all sorts of different types of correlations, which you know, which which may not be obvious if you're if you're looking at the outcrop scale, but you know, at a mine scale, these are all really important things that uh, that that, uh, that we'd like to sort of think of, and we try to incorporate that into all all of the information that that, that we do generate. And I'll just add one sort of final thing. You know, you talked about decision making. You've got your rock, you've got your core box, and you've got your exploration scale. And so, you know, that comes down to remembering that this is a tool, that this is another tool in our toolbox. And so, you know, if you're going to decide to scan, you know, your entire deposit worth of core um, and then use that data to model, well, that data is only as good as the drill spacing that you selected or the targets that you selected or whatever it is that you're dealing with. So again, remembering that this is a tool and understanding that the decisions you make about what it is that you analyze, um, what parameters you use to analyze it, all have to fit in with the broader scheme of, again, those goals that you're trying to accomplish um, either in your exploration or your, or your mining program. Um, I also saw there was a question about um, processing time. So how long does it take to process the data? Um, Aaron, do you want to take that one? Uh, 
usually we say about a six week turnaround time between scanning and deliverable of our mineral lots, which is the final product. Um, and, but really it could potentially range between four to eight weeks, depending on how complicated uh, your, your mineralogy is. Um, in the beginning, there's a bit of a longer time lag, and that's because we are developing your project spectral library. Um, and then uh, we also, uh, depending on a project, if we're doing on-site processing, um, which is a bit of a different setup, uh, we have computers on site that collect and start processing using templates um, created previously. Uh, and that turnaround time can uh, be, you know, like maybe 200, 200 meters uh, a day. Um, you'll receive logs for those 200 meters. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we certainly are working with uh, a lot of data, a lot of information. Um, different, di different systems process this data uh, in different ways. And it really depends on uh, sort of on the, on the, on the resolution of, of all the instruments we're working with. Um, at CoreScan, we're processing sort of three different channels of data. We, we're looking at the RGB, we do, do, do the photography, the hyperspectral data, as well as the core profiler. So all of those data have to be sort of processed to a certain extent. But once all the templates and stuff are set up, it's, it's purely just a question of computing power. If we are working on site, uh, we can have scanners going during the day. Once all the libraries and all the uh, parameters have been established uh, for a specific program, as Aaron said, we can turn things around so that you can be uh, scanning core uh, during the day, processing at night, and that, uh, that data can be available the next day uh, for, for the loggers to be working with uh, in, in the core shed. So there's a bit of a, a setup process once we start, uh, once you start to, to get a, a, a massive um, sort of project underway. Uh, but, the, but the actual processing time is uh, once all those sort of bits and pieces are in place, and it really is just a question of, of your computing power. Excellent. Um, I saw there was another follow-up question um, from Sebastian about the fracture stuff, so I'm going to jump in and take advantage of this situation. Um, so talking about um, the knowledge of whether a fracture is natural or mechanical is important for calculating your RQD, which you're absolutely right it is. Um, and how is this managed in your process or is it part of the QAQC's process and the responsibility of the end user? Do you think the classification of a fracture as either mechanical or natural would be automated through your process? Um, Really good question. It is very important to differentiate between those. Um, at the moment, there's a few different mechanisms that we have as part of our process. The first is that if they are marked mechanical breaks on your drill core, and those marks are visible in the image. So for instance, if you have a yellow X on your, your drill core where you have your mechanical breaks, then we actually have a machine learning algorithm that can go through, detect those um, marks. And then it, it basically removes any fractures um, from your RQD calculation that are within um, a certain distance of that marker. So that's one way to do it. Um, that does require the client to mark up the drill core before it's scanned. Um, although if you're paying a drilling contractor to put orientation lines on, I would hope that they would also put your, your mechanical brake marks on there as well. Um, I think down the road, um, there will be a mechanism to start to train machine learning models on what mechanical brakes look like within a project. And I say that because, you know, it's, we go through the same decision process in a machine learning model that we would as a human. So we would say, okay, look, my mechanical brakes are more likely to be the brakes that are perpendicular uh, to the drill core axis. Um, they tend to be quite tight because the drill core fits together uh, quite nicely. Um, and there tends to be very little weathering um, actually in that fracture. So that's a really great example of where having the hyperspectral um, data, so you can see your mineralogy, having the laser profiling data, so you can see where your fractures are and how tight they are, and having the RGB image actually helps you address this, um, this issue of mechanical versus, um, versus natural. So that's something we're looking at down the road is actually what is it about the mineralogy, the aperture, the fracture, fractures um, and, the, and the orientation of the fractures relative to the core axis that tell us that it's more likely to be a uh, mechanical break than a natural break. Um, but we will also have mechanisms in place again so that the user end user can QA, QC, um, because at the end of the day, our users are the primary source of knowledge on what these rocks are. And um, we want to make sure that there's an opportunity for them to go through and actually QC that information. Good question. Um, I just saw there's one from uh, Philip in there. 
Um, do you want me to jump in here? So Philip, any says any mineral or mineral groups that you feel might need a better characterization of their spectral responses and any weird or rare minerals that we've got in our spectral libraries? Well, Philip, I personally keep a running list of all sorts of things that we would like to have characterized better. Um, so if any time anybody uh, has some, some free research money and they want to do some work, um, Pranite is certainly one of them in these systems. I think that we could really spend a lot of time looking uh, at Pranite, looking at the, 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 the geochemical variations. It really is not um, well established in any way. Uh, one of my other current favorites is Vesuvianite. Um, and actually this would probably be a good one for UBC Lee Grote. I know it's definitely one of Lee Grote's favorite minerals, but the actual spectral response of Vesuvianite, it is extremely variable. It's a very common mineral um, in, in a lot of SCARN systems, for example, but uh, in terms of uh, correlating the geochemical variations to spectral response, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it is, is still a bit ambiguous. Um, lithium, lithium-based minerals. There's a there's a whole a whole field uh, of work uh, in terms of the lithium uh, mineralogy. Uh, we're actually doing we're trying to sort of build, build up our own uh, spectral library uh, for a lot of those phases. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of part of a running list. That's sort of what I can think of at the moment. But we certainly have have a lot of ideas, and we we are certainly very well aware of of the gaps and where where the where the mineralogy, where, where the mineral geochemistry, um, what we see on a regular basis. So there's that's sort of some of the highlights, but we, we do tend to uh, tend to keep a running list of, of things that would certainly be, you know, very, very useful uh, for, for the industry to, to, uh, to have some better, uh, better, better handle on. I would say even beyond just mineral species, um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is what would the spectral response be if you have an inner layered, say, smectite illite, versus uh, a pixel that happens to catch both smectite and illite. What, what would the spectral response be? Could you tell the difference? Because um, again, from a processing perspective, that's quite important to know if they're actually interlayered or if they are actual separate phases. Um, so that's even, even sort of that, um, that piece of it is, is quite interesting and it's something that we would love to learn more about. So again, if there are any researchers online, um, you know, UBC across the globe, um, reach out to us if you have samples that are characterized and you're interested in it. Um, CoreScan does do quite a lot of uh, research work. So yeah, get a hold of us, let us know what you have and, and we can talk. Um, Mindful of time, yes, Jean. I, I see your message. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I do notice there's a, there's one I was from Mark Peterson as well. Yeah. Do we have time, Jean? We do. Go for it. We keep time. Mm -hmm. um, so Mark is asking it. Uh, at what stage of the exploration cycle are most companies applying hyperstructural technology? Whether it's early grassroots uh, resource delineation, downstream production, um, sort of where where's the feel for that? I'd say at, at all levels, certainly uh, a lot of the, the bulk of sort of where this, uh, where the, the sort of the handheld instruments and SWIR technology started was certainly in uh, sort of the uh, exploration, mineral exploration um, from grassroots to sort of uh, camp scale exploration. But we're, there, there's a lot of applications. Uh, so one, one of those diagrams, that, that diagram that Aaron showed at the very beginning, you know, mineralogy across the mine cycle you know, I, and companies are starting to do this more. Ideally, they're very well aware that we need to collect uh, really consistent uh, mineralogical data right from the early stages of the campaign because it does carry through, carries through the life of mine um, from the processing to through to uh, mine remediation. So all of those are really, um, all the stages are really critical. I'd say that um, we're getting a lot more interest in terms of the, um, resource uh, geometallurgy sort of processing uh, side of things at this stage but it come we, we get we get uh, we get interest from sort of from from the full range and uh, not really early grassroots I mean we tend to be more uh, sort of brownfields to sort of establish sort of drill campaigns but we do do some uh, you know just hand sample uh, hand sample work as well it's not as common uh, is that 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 type of information is is, is usually uh, collected from you know early sort of hand uh, hand sample point point data collection. And there's yeah, you're absolutely right, Carrie. And so like that, the point systems are very common, especially in early early projects, even even at sort of the um, you know like claim evaluation level. Um, 
But the other thing that's sort of happening um, in technological developments is they're actually looking at a lot of sort of on the belt sensor technology that uses hyperspectral imaging. So for instance, that talc problem, um, talc shows up absolutely beautifully in the hyperspectral data. And so they're looking at actually putting, it's essentially a point detector, but actually mounting it on a processing belt so that the material that's coming into your mill is actually getting scanned to flag if there's any material that could have um, could have talc in it, for instance. So um, a lot of this technology, again, sort of taking it out of the sort of core scan, you know, Pima, TerraSpec, uh, Highlogger realm is actually being applied by engineers that may have never thought about this solution before, but they see the applicability of having something like this on board, and they're making that a part of their mill and um, and processing design as well. So. So you actually see it in quite a, a few different places um, throughout the mining cycle, and and it does have application, I would say, in all those spaces. Um, but yeah, it carries right. The uptake um, is sort of variable depending on which specific technology you're talking about, but you will see hyperspectral technology in all aspects. Yeah, is that it, Jean? Are there other questions? It looks like that's all the questions. So um, I'm going to close here. It's uh, 135. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, Team CoreScan again for an awesome presentation and to all of you who stuck around. Um, like I mentioned, this presentation will be uploaded within a week. Um, you'll find it on the MDRU YouTube channel. And our next Zoom with MDRU is in October, so October 21st. And I wanted to make sure that you guys have it penciled in. Uh, the MDRU 30th anniversary is this year. So we are in the moment of planning. Um, it, it's The dates will be announced soon. We're thinking sometime in November. It's an opportunity for us to not just us, things like this to showcase our alumni and friends, but for us to really get together uh, virtually during this trying time. So um, stay tuned. Hopefully by October, we'll get more information by then. Um, meanwhile, I uh, hope you guys have a good afternoon or an evening and we'll hopefully get have you guys join us soon. <laughs>